Is there a new era of good feelings on Capitol Hill? Democrats and Republicans worked together to fix an important part of Medicare last week. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell finally agreed to hold a confirmation vote for the president's attorney general nominee. And the president is working with top Republicans to get a trade bill passed. So I got to bring in our expert on all things politics, Bloomberg Politics Managing Editor Mark Halperin. Mark, I'm sure you're down there just getting mad. Nannies, petties, and spray tans for the White House Correspondents' Dinner or weekend. But I think you've also had some time to have a sit down with John Boehner. That's coming up later today. We'll talk to John Boehner. It'll appear on, with all due respect, 5 Eastern time. But in terms of the, the we're about 100 days into the new all Republican controlled Congress. And I got to tell you, driving in from the airport this morning, my cab driver was singing Kumbaya. There's a new thing going on in the city now where things are getting done. And not the big things, not things like tax reform, not big things like a big transportation bill yet, not immigration reform, not entitlement reform, but some of the smaller things, the Medicare fix, um, maybe this trade deal, are happening not just with Republicans, but in a bipartisan way, and sometimes with the president along too. So it is different, and John Boehner and I will talk about why it's different and how it is that things have changed pretty quickly, again, just over 100 days into this Congress. Mark, based on what you know already, before you talk to Boehner, why, why is this happening? Well, it's a good question, Eric. I'm going to talk to him about that. It, it, part of it is the, the majority, John Boehner, Mitch McConnell, the two leaders, the speaker and the leader, they're deal makers, they're legislators, and they recognize that they have a responsibility to govern. But we shouldn't think about it just in terms of cynical politics, which sometimes our colleagues do. They want to get things done for the country. They want to address the problems, and they're willing to work with Democrats. And you see, particularly in the Senate, but a little bit in the House, you do see this pent-up hunger. Even some of the rank and file members, even if they're on the far left or the far right, they didn't come here to do nothing. They came here to do stuff. And Boehner and McConnell are very skillfully tapping into this desire to show that the Republicans can lead in the majority, but also try to get things done to address some of the challenges the country faces now. Mark, for, forgive me for being a little bit cynical here, but if they truly came to Washington to get things done and to do stuff for the country, why didn't that happen before there was a Republican majority? <laughs> well, because... There's a lot of polarization, right? And so if you're a House member, your district is really conservative and doesn't much care for President Obama. And so it's hard to get those Republican House members to do stuff in line with President Obama, just as in the Senate. If you're a Democratic senator, your state's probably a blue state in almost every case now. And your constituents, for the most part, don't want you to make a deal with Mitch McConnell. So both parties have a lot of pull. There's a lot of centrifugal force towards the extreme left and the extreme right. I think we've seen in the past, we saw it when President Clinton was in office, for instance, when you have divided government, when you have at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue a Democrat, as we do now, and at this end of Pennsylvania Avenue a Republican, that divided government, somewhat counterintuitively, has produced the kind of bipartisan deals, the kind of break in a gridlock now, as we've seen in the past. All right. I want your sense of how legit, how sincere these relations are. I want to pull up my favorite picture, Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner, really bosom buddies. I mean, that's a major kiss right there. There she is basking in the glory of the sun. He's got a serious lip smack on her. Is this for real? I call John Boehner now, and I will this afternoon when I see him. I call him the kissing speaker. There you he's, go. He's a man who... He's a man who understands uh, affection. Look, there are, again, it's a little bit of counterintuitive thing. There are within Capitol Hill, there are certainly some rivalries and some tensions and people who legitimately don't like each other. But when people say, like when John Boehner will say, I like Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi will say, I like John Boehner, they really do like each other personally. In the past, go back to Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, people built on those personal ties in order to leverage forward towards some bipartisanship. What we've seen, again, up until recently for the most part here in the last few years is, despite the personal ties, they're not able to work together and get things done. That may be changing a little bit. It hasn't extended to President Obama yet. Most Republicans still don't have that personal tie. You notice John Boehner did not kiss the president. That's the kind of change we'll need to get one of those big things through, like tax reform, like immigration, like entitlement reform. That's what that would require, the personal bonds. Maybe not a kiss. We can say, Stephanie, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the road to a John Boehner, President Obama kiss? I think it's, I won't say it's essential, but it couldn't hurt. Gotcha. Uh, Mark, the reporting is beginning to dribble out from Clinton Cash, this book that will appear on May the 5th uh, by Peter Schweitzer. 
the, there's a story you know about it in the New York Times, but others may have not seen it, documenting the flow of funds into the Clinton Foundation, into uh, President Clinton himself uh, in return for giving speeches that may have had some connection with the State Department approval and government approval in general of... Uh, you know, of the purchase of some U.S. uranium assets by a Russian company. How much of an impact uh, might this have and subsequent reporting have on Hillary's campaign? Are people talking about that in Washington right now? They are. Look, even if you just take the known facts, no speculation, no assumption of quid pro quos or wrongdoing, the Clintons operated a world, some people call it Clinton Inc., where they helped... Uh, work with people around the world doing great work for the Clinton Foundation, took money from rich people, not just Americans, but from around the world, governments, businesses, individuals. And often they, they traveled with those people, or in one case, at least President Clinton took a very large check from a group like that. And then some of those companies would occasionally get help from the U.S. government, sometimes from the State Department. The appearance of that is not great. If you're somebody who wants the highest ethical standards, who wants to avoid any appearance of kind of co-mingling different worlds in a way that gives special access or maybe special treatment to someone, you just stayed away from that. But the Clintons chose not to. And now the hunt is on for quid pro quos, for some case where the State Department or another government entity did favors for, or gave special treatment to somebody who helped the Clintons. That hunt will go on beyond this book. And it's a problem for Hillary Clinton because it's hard to answer those questions.